Plotkin, Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. You can find our organizational website at www.amazonteam.org. I'm an ethnobotanist by training. That's a scientist who works with indigenous colleagues to study and sometimes document the use of medicinal and other plants. Uh, the Amazon Conservation Team has been described as the greatest rainforest conservation organization most people have never heard of. We have, over the course of our 26-year history, partnered with over 100 different indigenous groups to map and improve management over uh, 90 million acres of ancestral rainforests. And that's just part of what we do. We have a major focus on empowering indigenous women. Uh, we created the first and longest running indigenous park ranger program, the Shaman's Apprentice program, and lots of other cool stuff. And I'll be talking about some of that this evening. This is a special holiday broadcast brought to you by the Plants of the Gods podcast, of which I'm the host. Plants of the Gods focuses on medicinal and hallucinogenic plants and fungi. And the idea is to present these life-changing uh, plants and fungi in a broader context, not just in terms of the hallucinogenic, entheogenic uh, aspects, but also from the creation of religion to the impact of human culture, in fact, there's a very popular theory called the Stone Date Theory created by the late Terence McKenna, where he said it was when our ancestors discovered magic mushrooms that human consciousness began. And that's been commemorated in a new coffee cup by Jim Figoro. Uh, this is my Hanukkah present for all you fellow psychonauts. And they also honored my mentor, Richard Schultes. Uh, Jim Figora, F-I-G-O-R-A, has created these and some other wonderful uh, cups to essentially honor the role of these mind-altering substances in our culture and our species and even our pre-species in terms of the uh, stone date theory. I always have to pair this with the drunken monkey hypothesis, which said that our ancestors came out of the trees, ate the ripest fruits on the ground, and many of those ripe fruits were fermented, and that led to an altered state because of the alcohol. And so the creation of human culture and human consciousness was not due to magic mushrooms, it was due to alcohol. And the reason I mention this is because in the Plants of the Gods podcast, we have a whole episode on the ethnobotany of wine. So again, we're trying to frame uh, how these plants have impacted, are impacting, and how these plants and fungi will impact us in the future, which brings us to the Amazon. As I said, I'm an ethnobotanist. I've been working in and on the Amazon for the better part of four decades, studying and learning from these tribal shamans. My mentor, Richard Evan Schultes, uh, the so-called father of ethnobotany, often said to me, uh, we may have PhDs, but these indigenous peoples know a lot more about this stuff than we do. And the more I study this, the more I find it to be true. Now, one of the things I like to start out with on these Facebook Live sessions is ask people where they're from, where they're calling in from. So please put that in the chat. It's useful for us to understand our demographics. And we have so many listeners that tend to tune in from Colombia and Mexico that I promise that the upcoming season will have a special episode on the mind-altering substances of Colombia and Mexico. I had the honor of visiting Oaxaca in southern Mexico, which is where Richard Schultes first discovered. And when ethnobotanists say discovered, they always say discovered, because we don't really discover anything. It's our indigenous mentors uh, colleagues and guides who interest to the, introduce us to these things. Schultes discovered magic mushrooms in Oaxaca in 1936, and that led to the psychedelic renaissance, which we're all a part of, that led to the discovery of psilocybin, which my beloved colleague Paul Stamets refers to as the 
uh, Einstein molecule but has been found useful for so many different things. As most of us know, hallucinogens are now revolutionizing the treatment of supposedly incurable diseases like PTSD, uh, schizophrenia, uh, obesity, insomnia, and through the magic of microdosing, and a colleague of mine at the LSU Medical School in my hometown in New Orleans, we're finding out the tiny doses of hallucinogens don't make you hallucinate, but they can have other therapeutic aspects as well. This is Charlie Nichols working on new treatments for asthma using microdoses of hallucinogens. So the panorama keeps widening. I want to focus tonight particularly on the Amazon because that's my area of specialty. And as I said, I've been working in and on for a long time. And the more I learn, the more I learn about the less I know. Once again, the indigenous peoples are my best teachers. Anybody who's had the privilege of tracking down a trekking down a jungle trail behind an indigenous shaman, or in some cases, even a, a, a peasant healer, uh, has realized how much more these people know about these ecosystems than we do. This is not to say that indigenous peoples know everything, that they have all the answers, they don't. But it's that marriage of 21st century technology and indigenous wisdom, which I think is the best hope for uh, protecting the Amazon and many other, if not most, of the ecosystems of the world. 20 years ago, the chief of the Trio tribe in the Northeast Amazon asked the Amazon conservation team for help mapping its land, which we gave him, but it wasn't in the form he wanted. He wanted us to map his lands. We said, no, we're not gonna map your lands. We're gonna teach you to map your lands. And through the work of people like Brian Hetler, our ace cartographer here at the Amazon conservation team, we've been able to part with, par partner with over a hundred different indigenous groups to help them map their lands. And what we say is the way to protect the Amazon is map, manage, protect. In other words, you don't know what you got unless you map it. And I could spend an hour on this. Once you map it, well, that's an incipient management plan, not a management plan. We then turn it into a management plan. What are the borders? Do you put signs at the borders? Do you put guards at the borders? Uh, next, you gotta protect it. Once you know what the borders are, you need park guards, you need indigenous rangers. This is pioneered by our Northeast Amazon program under the guidance of uh, Minu Parahu, uh, a local Suriname. I love this picture dearly because as an ethnobotanist, I've been studying the indigenous peoples of the Amazon for a very long time, but there are many other people living there. We know that there's 30 million people living in the Amazon. Indigenous peoples are one component. This is perhaps in some ways the most surprising and intriguing component. All the people in the top of the picture, those African-American women, are Maroons. Maroons are descendants of slaves who were brought to the Northeast Amazon hundreds of years ago. They got off the slave ship and said, hey, this is a cultural rainforest. We'll see you white boys later. And they ran off into the jungle. So you have Afro-American populations, uh, much closer linked to the original African diaspora than African-Americans and, and most of the rest of the Western Hemisphere. And uh, if we go back to that picture again, on the left, you see Minu, our program director in the Northeast Amazon. And Minu is a descendant of Hindustani immigrants to South America, brought over as contract laborers when uh, uh, Suriname was still Dutch Guiana. So here you are in the middle of the Amazon where the woman uh, descended from uh, Indians, Hindustanis, teaching women descended from Africans how to save the Amazon forest. This kind of sums up uh, the Amazon and the Amazon conservation team in, uh, in, in one piece. And there's something else I want to point out about this, and this is something that's often given short shrift, that when we talk about how to save the Amazon, part of that is empowering local women, particularly tribal women. These are not Indians, obviously. They are Maroons, but they are part of a tribal society. And when we set out to map, uh, I'm a guy, I started working with the guys in the tribe and we thought we'd made the best map possible. Wrong. These are Ipeng from the Brazilian Xingu in the Southeast Amazon. There's a wonderful new book on the Xingu, Xingu X-I-N-G-U by my buddy John Hemming, who's the greatest historian of, of Amazonia. Anyhow, what we found out was that the women hold a different landscape in their head. Let me say that again. The women hold a different landscape in their head. And here's why that's important. The men know the farthest reaches of the territory because that's where they go to hunt. The women know the uh, lands around the village and in the village because that's where they farm. So I don't want to oversimplify and say the men do all the hunting and the women do all the farming. Um, but 
mostly that's true, at least in the tribes that I've had a chance to work with. And so by asking the women to make their maps and asking the men to make their maps, we end up with a more holistic approach, more detailed understanding of the ecosystem. And I got to tell you, when you work with shamanic cultures, they're also mapping the invisible world sometimes. For example, uh, we're doing a map in the Shingu with the uh, uh, shaman of the Kamayara tribe. And uh, they're making the map. And I said, oh, what's this thing on the legend here? He says, well, that's a two-headed black jaguar. And I said, two-headed black jaguar? He goes, yeah, it's invisible. And I said, it's invisible? How do you... So have you ever seen this? No, stupid, it's invisible. I said, what does this mean? He said, well, they're sacred and they live in the headwater, so you can't go there. Well, this is actually a very sophisticated ecological principle. You shouldn't be mucking around in the headwaters. That's where the forest and, and the river begins. So we're hearing a lot of talk about headwaters in the Amazon. The headwaters of the Amazon are in the Peruvian Andes. When was this figured out? Samuel Fritz in the late 1600s, this is a great story, it's covered in my book, Amazon. Samuel Fritz, a Czech missionary, uh, was sent to the Amazon to missionize the indigenous peoples, which is awful and uh, almost always has a, a long-term negative result on the culture. But he was also a cartographer, and he was the one who figured that the Amazon was coming out of the Peruvian Andes. The headwaters are the farthest reaches from the mouth of a river. So the mouth of the Amazon is in Brazil, which is in the Atlantic. And uh, just a, a, a note to give you a, a sense of scale, the mouth of the Amazon in the wet season is 325 miles wide. Now, I grew up on the mouth of Mississippi. I'm from New Orleans. 325 miles is bigger than the distance from Washington to New York. That's the mouth of the river. And the headwaters, which are the furthest point from where the river empties into the ocean, are straight west across Brazil, and then it takes a, a southward turn into Peru. So the headwaters of the Amazon are in um, Peru. The headwaters were discovered, the ultimate source uh, was discovered, discovered by my late colleague, Lauren McIntyre, who was the great uh, photojournalist from National Geographic. Many of the iconic images of indigenous peoples in traditional dress uh, that I grew up with in the latter half of the 20th century were taken by Lauren. And Lauren went to find the absolute headwater of the Amazon, the, the source lake, which he found way up in the Peruvian Andes. And it's now known as Laguna McIntyre in his, in his honor. If you make it up there, which very few people have, there's a plaque the Peruvians put up there honoring uh, Lauren's discovery of, of, of the lake. And why do I say discovery? Because subsequent expeditions found Inca mummies there. So clearly the indigenous peoples got there first, as we find time and time and time again of the important discoveries from the Amazon. And I don't know if, if, if everybody's seen, and I'm sure some of you have, that recent reports of analyses of these Inca mummies have found them full of ayahuasca. Okay, remember that ayahuasca is the sacred hallucinogen of the Amazon, native to the Northwest Amazon. A colleague of mine at Harvard is now using genomics to try and figure out where the actual wild ayahuasca came from. I happen to believe that the beginning of ayahuasca culture was in the Sibindoy Valley of uh, Colombia, and let me tell you why that's so. The lowest point between the Pacific and the Amazon, that is the, 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 the easiest way to cross the mountains, is right by the Sibindoy Valley. So if you're coming from the Pacific across the Andes to the Amazon, you're going through the Sibindoy Valley. And that's where Schultes first encountered, or should I say discovered, uh, ayahuasca in 1941. This is recounted in great detail in Wade Davis's book, One River. Uh, it's also recounted in our Schulte storybook map uh, on the Amazon Conservation Team website, amazonteam.org. Please check that out. And I'm reminding everyone, I know some people have signed on later. Let us know where uh, you're calling in from, where you're signing in from, so we have a better sense of who's, uh, who's tuning in. And also, I want to make this an interactive session. I'm not here to lecture. I'm here to talk and listen and answer questions or ask questions. So I know we have a number of people uh, who sent in questions. So I'm going to ask my uh, podcast wingman, Antonio, who works in the Shingu, uh, to share a, a question or two with us.
Hi, Mark. Thank Hi. you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I did have a question. Um, here we go. Um, there are a bunch of organizations that work in protection of the rainforest, and particularly the, the Amazon. Um, but you were talking about ACT, the Amazon Conservation Team. Um, and what would you say makes ACT so different from the others? Yeah, that's easy to answer because we were set up to be different. When uh, my partner Lillian and I looked at the map of the Amazon 30 years ago, we could see that 25% of the Amazon was in national parks and protected areas, and 25% was indigenous territories. So you had groups like the World Wildlife Fund, where I work, and Nature Conservancy, where she worked, focusing on protected areas, setting new ones up, and protecting the ones that existed. But nobody was partnering with the indigenous peoples to help empower them using tools like mapping and GPSs. So we specifically established the Amazon Conservation Team to do what we call biocultural conservation, to work in partnership with indigenous peoples to protect the rainforest and the rivers, uh, and to help these people protect their own culture from the outside forces that were pushing in from all sides. So our unique niche uh, was that we do this biocultural conservation on indigenous territories with indigenous peoples, but only when we're invited to do so. Now, other organizations uh, are, are, are trying to do this. It's not easy. But, uh, you know, the more the merrier. It's not like, okay, these are our indigenous peoples and you can't work with them. That's nonsense. Uh, these people need a lot of help. But I will say that that's our core competence. And that's why I think we do it as well as anybody. Actually, we do it better than everybody. That's my personal subjective opinion. Um, other questions, Antonio? Hi, Mark. Yeah. Hi, Mark. yeah. Another question that we have is how have the recent elections of pro-environmental or environmentalist candidates impacted the work that organizations like ACT or other conservation and indigenous partnering organizations are doing? You know, when I got started in this field in the early 80s, uh, Save the Amazon was a, a battle cry. Uh, who was against the rainforest, right? It was a real call to the ramparts. However, for a variety of reasons, the rainforest drifted out of the headlines. And uh, many of us in the field, not just at ACT, but other organizations, World Wildlife Fund, Nature Conservancy, Conservation National, wondering, how can we get the Amazon back in the headlines? Well, the answer came in 2019 with the Amazon fires, which wasn't the way that we wanted to get back in the headlines. But these terrible fires, really in the tens of thousands, uh, focused global attention on Amazonia and uh, brought attention that was warranted and needed, but at a terrible cost. Then you had COVID sweep through, which did a terrible number on forest people, particularly indigenous peoples. One estimate was that the uh, mortality rate amongst indigenous peoples in Amazonia was twice that of urban dwellers. So that um, we see that, you know, more people paying attention to the Amazon and in the age of climate change. As I often say, you know, the battle against climate change can't be won in the Amazon, but can sure be lost. If it all goes up in smoke, doesn't matter what we do to protect the wetlands in my native Louisiana, uh, we're screwed. And so the good news coming out of the Amazon are the elections in Brazil and Colombia. President Lula of Brazil has made a lot of uh, speeches about the value of the Amazon, protecting the Amazon, and much less covered has been that of the new president of Colombia, President Petro, who's done the same thing. And this is a very important uh essentially a misunderstanding of the general public, people equate the Amazon with Brazil. Brazil is 66% of the Amazon, but Colombia has as much diversity, and I'm not gonna go way into this, but you have a lot more mountains, you're closer to the Andes, so that creates hyper-diversity. And it's not like, well, we should protect Brazil, not Colombia, we should do both. But these are two good news stories that I think are not getting enough coverage because there's so much doom and gloom in the environmental uh, world, the environmental media, climate change, pollution, things like that. Much of that now being attacked, uh, hopefully effectively, by the Biden administration, which has been more good news. And whether you like Biden or not, and I do, uh, he's made several impassioned uh, speeches about the importance of Amazonia, which again has been overlooked by the media. I think they seem much more interested in uh, his kid's laptop. But there are reasons for hope. 
And I'm often asked, well, looking at the Amazon, and uh, is, is the glass half full or half empty? And the answer is any glass that's half full is half empty. We have more attention being focused on conservation in Amazonia than has been the case in decades. At the same time, we see the destruction that in the last few years has been faster than ever before. So clearly we're burning the candle, the candle at both ends. Now, I, I, I want to do a little preview of the upcoming seasonal plans to the gods, and then I'll answer some more questions. We've done three seasons. We're pushing towards a half a million downloads. That's very popular. Uh, it's a very high number for uh, a very low-tech broadcast. And I hope that people who like it will recommend it to their friends, give us a high rating, and uh, recommend it to others. And go back and listen to the episodes you haven't heard. For example, one of the most popular episodes, uh, which I don't understand in a, in a podcast based on hallucinations of the Amazon, is about absinthe. Uh, people love that episode. So if you haven't listened to it, tune in. Now, coming up in the next season is going to be an interview with Brian Mora Rescue, the guy who wrote The Immortality Key about how uh, the basis of Greek civilization is in part due to hallucinogens. That's covered in the Urgot episode. And the origins of, of many of the world's so-called major religions can be traced back to hallucinogens. We're going to have a major focus, probably a two-part episode on tobacco, which, as most of you know, is sacred to uh, Amerindian societies from the boreal forests of Canada all the way down to the groups that once inhabited Tierra del Fuego in the Southern Cone. I also want to do a two-part episode on beer, uh, which is surprisingly important in the evolution of human culture. There are those who say that uh, we invented bread to make beer, not the other way around. And so, in a sense, the creation of agriculture, the invention of agriculture, had more to do with catching a buzz from uh, beer uh, than it did with you know bread, which is the way I was taught when I was a kid. So, uh, Antonio, you have another question for me before we get a little bit more into some of these Amazon statistics? Yeah, we do. Um, we had one from someone commenting on Facebook asking, uh, what is the greatest need today of indigenous people of Amazonia? Yeah, there we go, from Jay, who you can see it on the screen. Uh, that is an excellent question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aronowitz. And, and that is that any difficult question or challenge has an answer which is both simple and wrong. That's a sort of me saying that I love dearly. And it's a mistake to think that the question is just about money. I, I've had this argument with colleagues. Well, we need to get all the money in the hands of the indigenous people, ASAP. You gotta understand that in a place like Mexico, you have indigenous peoples with law degrees, uh, medical degrees, PhDs, and that's all to the good. And in Amazonia, particularly in Northwest Amazon, you have people, indigenous peoples, who make fire by rubbing two sticks together. And, and that's not a condescending remark. I can't do that. These people know the forest far better than I do. But this idea that just money is the issue and let's just give all these guys a bunch of money or just give them a bunch of technology and, and the problem will be solved, it's, it's not that easy. It depends on what the needs are. In some cases, for example, in the Amazon Conservation Team Northwest Amazon program, we've had a major uh, initiative under the leadership of Carolina Hill, our director, to let the indigenous peoples know what their rights are under the Constitution. In other words, they were entitled to stuff that they didn't know because uh, either they were preliterate or they didn't speak Spanish. So, you know, empowerment is probably the simplest way I could put it. In some cases, it's giving them GPSs so they can map their lands. In some cases, it's walkie-talkies so they can find out where the gold miners are getting in. But the idea that, you know, one, one size fits all, uh, it's as ridiculous as the idea is when people say to me, you know, what plant do shamans use to cure this? There's probably 400 tribes in Amazonia, 400 indigenous groups. And even within a tribe, even within a village, two shamans may not use the same plant for the same illness. And if they do, they don't uh, agree on the dosage. And if they do agree on the dosage, they don't agree on uh, how many days you take the plant stuff for. So what we need to be is flexible and reactive to figuring out what they say they need, uh, what we may also think they need, and, and, and working with that. And that's why the fact that we've worked so long and so well and so deeply with these cultures 
means that we're in an excellent position to help them figure out what they need and, and help them get it. For example, um, the, the the chief, the paramount chief of the trios on the CERN numbers of Border, where I worked with for over three decades, he passed away just a year ago. There's a dedication to him in our annual report. You know, whenever I'd get there, we'd have a crew to a play where say, okay, chief, you know, catching up, how's the family? What do you guys need? And they had a, a terrible rainstorm and he thought they needed a new and bigger church. And I said, ask the Pope. He's got more money than we do. And that's not what we're here to help with. So again, the point being that uh, we want to help. Uh, we as a small environmental organization can't do everything. The needs are so great, but it has to be based on an individual basis um, on, on, on what they need and, and what we see the threats are. So, Antonio? Mark, yes, we have another one here. Um, we have one from Wes. Yep. How and what technology is being used for preservation? Good question, Wes. Thank you for asking that. I think the fundamental uh, technology of greatest importance is GPS units because we can now map down to the single tree. This has to be used uh, both uh, with the ground truth thing that the indigenous peoples do once they've been trained and also with aerial photography. So you have the eye in the sky and the feet in the mud. It's not either or. And that uh, also there's an issue about technology, which a lot of people don't understand, particularly in Silicon Valley. They think we just need to get these guys all the technology. Well, one of the shamans in the Colombian Amazon complained to me one time, you know, we give these kids all these uh, technology tools and then they need money to get the cards uh, to fuel these things. And we've actually had uh, kids move to the city just because they couldn't earn enough of a living to buy SIM cards so the technology can have a, a downside as well. So by introducing the GPS and the assorted stuff, you know, cell phones and things, where they go around and record uh, grandmother and grandfather talking about why they call this waterfall by such and such a name, and here was this great battle, and then uh, filming some of the plants and creating a video archive, this is being done by them for them, not, not by us for the outside world, is a way to introduce technology as a means to help protect the culture and the forest rather than undercutting it, which is what happens when the white man or white woman shows up and just hands out all this technology and, and basically leaves them with the idea that we know all the answers and we have all the magic and everything we know is right and true, which obviously is not the case. It's a, it's a good question. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the biodiversity of the Amazon because I don't want to give that such short shrift. I fell in love with the Amazon in 1978 and uh, I'm still falling in love with it. So let me read just a little uh, a paragraph or two from my book about fish diverse in the Amazon to show you that no matter how much we talk about the nuts and bolts of protecting it, uh, why it's just so endlessly wonderful and fascinating. This focuses on fish diversity. The rivers of Amazonia contain the ichthyological equivalent of the Mose Isley Cantina in the Star Wars universe a collection of bizarre and improbable creatures that sometimes defy belief. There are fish that spend most of their lives standing on their head and others that stand mostly on their tail. There are fish that eat people, fish that impale people, fish that shock people, and fish that invade people. That's the dreaded kangaroo. The Amazon harbors some of the world's largest freshwater fish, some of the smallest, that's from 14 feet to less than an inch, uh, some of the most beautiful and some of the ugliest. That's the sucker catfish we see in our aquaria. This ecosystem is home to hundreds of species of catfish, most of which have whiskers, as well as eight species of dogfish, all of which possess large canines. The Amazon is home to fish that talk, fish that walk, fish with bony tongues, fish shaped like banjos, fish with giant human-like molars, and fish that swim backwards. There are not only carnivorous piranhas, one species hunts in packs that can strip an ox in minutes, but vegetarian ones as well, as well as fish that eat fish, fish that eat fruits, fish that eat seeds, fish that eat fins, fish that eat snails, fish that eat tails, and fish that eat snails. Dr. Seuss couldn't have done it better. Other questions, Antonio? Yeah, here we go. Um, 
Another question that we got was what, if any, impact um, does the psychedelic renaissance have on rainforest conservation? Good question. So we're living in the psychedelic renaissance. That's the rebirth and interest in these mind-altering plants and fungi. Some trace this to uh, Aldous Huxley's publication of Brave New World in the 50s. Uh, some traces to Richard Schulte's discovery, discovery of psilocybin and magic mushrooms in Oaxaca in 1936. But what's clear is that this is giving new impetus to the interest in natural products. This is creating new understanding of the value of shamanic wisdom. And this is teaching us once again that biodiversity still holds secrets, that Mother Nature still has secrets up her sleeve or in her medicine chest that we are beginning to understand. Part of my frustration is when people say, well, we have the internet or we have uh, the mass spectrometer. So who needs new medicines from nature? Who needs new medicine from the rainforest? And the answer is we do. Western medicine is the most sophisticated system of healing ever devised, but where's the, where's the cure for pancreatic cancer? Where's the cure for insomnia? Where's the cure for alcoholism? Some of these cures are in the rainforest today or other parts of the natural world. I think the coral reefs are gonna to prove to be uh, almost as important. Mother nature has been creating weird and wonderful chemicals for 3 billion years. Certainly there's still stuff out there that we haven't found. And the same is true of hallucinogens. There was a foundational con conference in San Francisco, 1967. This was the summer of love organized by Richard Schultes, organized by Albert Hoffman, uh, the inventor of LSD, called the Ethnopharmacologic Search for New Psychedelic Drugs, ESPD. And they talked about all the known hallucinogens and what the potential was. Well, my pal Dennis McKenna decided 50 years later, which was five years ago, that this needed to be revisited. And it was phenomenal how many new things had uh, come to light since then. Not only new stuff like hallucinogenic frogs, which we now know exist in the Amazon and in the Sonoran Desert, but uh, work by my friend Shaheen, uh, who has traced the origin of Zoroastrianism, the original religion of, of Iran, of, of Persia, to some of these same alkaloids. So we're still learning about the past and we're still learning about the future. So yes, there's other new stuff out there. How do I know? I'm extrapolating. The past predicts the future. If the greatest minds in science 55 years ago hadn't figured out everything that was out there because there were still indigenous peoples that hadn't been asked, because there were still stuff that hadn't been explored, there's more out there for sure. Thank you, Mark. There was a part two to this question. Um, for individuals who are interested in ayahuasca, is there any way they can ethically partake or best give back to the Yahe cultures? Well, I, I find it a bit frustrating in the middle of the psychedelic renaissance that people are discovering these things and talking about their one, they're now one with nature, they understand the oneness of all things, but they don't seem very interested in giving back to uh, the cultures or the forests or the plants, or the fungi that uh, gave them these insights. So there's no easy way that you can just help these people or help these plants. But I would say that step one is to think, okay, how can I get back? What can I do? Certainly one of the ways to do is support uh, an environmental organization like, oh, I don't know, the Amazon Conservation Team. It is the holiday season. If you have gifts to give and you don't give, make a donation in somebody's honor. We'll acknowledge it. But really you want to focus on groups that are working in partnership with indigenous peoples or working to propagate or protect these plants and fungi or the forests in which they occur. And so it was once again, a, a difficult question that doesn't have uh, a, a, an easy answer. And when we talk about protect the Amazon, I, I, there's a, a little bit of a rough analogy I like to use here. It's kind of like peace in the Middle East in the sense that we, we know the broad outlines of how things might be settled, but the devil is in the details. Uh, it's not easy. If it was easy, it would have been done. And, and just to give a, a list of threats to the Amazon, and this is by no means a complete list. What's threatening the Amazon? What's destroying the Amazon? Cattle, dams, gold, large agriculture, small-scale agriculture, logging, climate change, deforestation, oil and gas, overhunting, and the uh, very negative 
influence of China. Uh, I know in Suriname, where I do most of my work, the jaguars are being decimated because the Chinese are exporting their teeth because they can't get enough tiger teeth. There's nothing medicinal in jaguar teeth. They're just bones. It's just calcium. And when you destroy the jaguars, you're destroying the trap predator, which upsets the whole ecosystem. So what's destroying the Amazon? What's destroying ecosystems around the world? Very simply, stupidity and greed, the human condition. So we have never had more information at our fingertips. Like I said, we can map down to a single tree. When we started mapping from the year, when we began mapping 20 years ago, which began in Suriname and spread to many other Amazonian countries, uh, a single pixel, a single aerial photo, the smallest we get was about two meters, about six feet. Now, last time I checked, it was less than an inch. And that's going to continue to decline. Bill Lawrence, who writes very thoughtfully about uh, development and destruction in the tropics, in, in, particularly in Amazonia, said, why are we building roads in the wrong places? Okay, if we're going to build roads, let's do it in ways with minimal impact. We have the information. Why are people still building dams? Dams are methane factories. Dams are like pumps to create climate change, and they're still being built. So we need to think more long-term. We also need to think in ways where it's not about the benefit of, of giant corporations. Let me tell you a story. I had to sit down with the environmental minister of Brazil, who since resigned in disgrace under the previous administration. This was organized by Tom Lovejoy, my, my dear mentor who passed away last year. And I said to the minister, um, and there were other environmental people around the table, I said, so we all want the same thing here. We all want uh, a thriving Brazil. We want a thriving economy, but destroying the Amazon, I think all of the rest of us at the, at the table can agree, is not in your long-term interest. And he said, well, we need jobs. And I said, really? Because I just came back from the soy fields in Mato Grosso, which is a Brazilian state, and it's all mechanized. Okay, that's not jobs. There's less jobs there than there was a forest. I said, no, I'm not blaming Brazil. Mechanized agriculture is the capitalist system. I mean, that was invented in my country, okay? But the idea that you have to destroy the environment to create jobs is not a long-term solution. And if you want to put money in the pockets of the poorest people, uh, whether it's the indigenous peoples or the, the peasants, uh, campesinos, caboclos, uh, or my indigenous colleagues you see here in Suriname, uh, mega industry is not the way to do it. There's lots of ways to create work and generate income in the Amazon, but they're not going to wow uh, the, the mega capitalists on Wall Street or in Paris or, or, or London. We need a much softer, long-term approach. Ecotourism. Uh, my wife, Liliana, is from Costa Rica, co-founder of the Amazon Conservation Team. And as she points out, the major source of foreign exchange uh, in Costa Rica is ecotourism. And it's a wonderful country with a lot to see. But it ain't the Amazon. So this is an arguing against Costa Rica. It's like if you've been to Costa Rica and you fell in love with it, you really need to see the Amazon. But you can't see the Amazon if it's all going to be cut down and turned into cheap soy for the Chinese or the Dutch or the Americans. Okay. Uh, a softer approach is needed. We need better use of degraded lands. We need better protection of, of the pristine thing. And just to finish up with the conversation with this environmental minister, I said, you know what? Brazil has long been the leader in South America in terms of conservation. And Neil Wilson, I knew back in my Harvard days, the greatest uh, biologist of the 20th century, said we need a 50-50 plan. 50% 50 of the planet needs to be developed. 50% of the planet needs to be preserved. Well, guess what? Brazil's already done that. 50% of the Brazilian Amazon is protected nominally. 25% is in parks and other protected areas. 25% is indigenous lands. So you've done the hard work, you've created this, but keep bad development out of these areas, extractive industry and things like that. So this is what I mean when I say the answers are obvious in a broad sense, it's just the devil's in the details. No, definitely, thank you, Mark. Um, so one thing that we wanted to ask about um, before we got to wrapping up was about the Plants of the Gods podcast. Um, so we're nearing, so the Plants of the God podcast is nearing half a million downloads and listeners. Um, and we really just wanted to ask what you thought was the key to, to the popularity or the success so far. 
Well, to give that some thought, I think clearly the, the topic itself lends itself to broad interest, you know, mind altering substances, hallucinogens, shamans, things like that. But what, what I've tried to do, what we at the Amazon Conservation have tried to do differently is make sure that everything is based scientifically, it's historically accurate, and painted into a bigger, uh, broader context. In other words, the effect of hallucinogens, not only on our species, but on the creation of our species through the stone date theory or the drunken monkey theory. And then to be able to weave it into a weird and wonderful aspects like absinthe being the inspiration of the greatest painter of the 20th century, Picasso, and absinthe being the inspiration of the greatest novelist of the 20th century, Ernest Hemingway. So I, I guess the, the aim here is to try and untelescope this understanding of these compounds that continue to have such a, a great impact on us. And, you know, as an, uh, a, a student of history, the past predicts the future. So if you look at the impact these things have had in the past, you can understand the potential for what they have in the future if, if we do it the right way. Also, I think the fact that I've taken a lot of these things and I've taken a lot of a lot of these things uh, gives me a a, a bit of a soapbox to stand on. And the fact that I was a student of, of Richard Schulte's. Um, so I really learned from, from the master uh, or the masters because I've been working with these shamans for so long. So it uh, might be a little longer answer than you asked for, but that's what my assessment of why things. And we've also been turbocharged by people like uh, my, my friend, Tim Ferriss, who's really uh, helped uh, spread our word and, and actually run some of our, uh, stuff like plants of the of the plants of the apes, which showed uh, how animals are using medicinal plants, how animals are using hallucinogenic plants, and uh, a shout out to my friend Chris Killam, the medicine hunter, who also has been in there chugging away to bring this to a broader audience in terms of the potential that's out there. Uh, it's a mistake to think that we've got everything from nature. It's a mistake to think we've got everything from the Amazon. But going back to this question of, of giving back. And this gets to the root of, of, of ethnobotany in this age of decolonialization. Uh, gracias, Guillermo. Llamando de Puebla, México. Right next door to Oaxaca. Um, that, that, you know, we need to think how to give back, how to think how we can live softer on the land, how we can help people who need a helping hand, like the indigenous peoples or the Maroons. Uh, if, I, if I read one more interview with a billionaire who said he took ayahuasca and he now understands Bitcoin, I think I'll puke. And having, uh, having uh, taken a lot of ayahuasca, uh, I, I prefer to do my purging in a ceremony, not by reading about billionaires uh, who've taken this once and think they understand everything and are going to save the world. So um, I, I, I do want to, uh, as we wind down, uh, share some of these great statistics about the Amazon because I can never get tired of sharing these. And for those of you who are interested more, uh, my book, The Amazon, uh, contains most of the information I shared tonight. And uh, this is basically information that I used in the organization. The Amazon River and Rainforest play an outsized role in the well-being of the world. And... By that, I mean that these plants and animals benefit local, regional, national, and even international populations as well. The most important and most immediate beneficiaries of these uh, benefits of these plants and fungi is, of course, the local people. That's primarily the indigenous peoples. Here you see me with a shaman of the, of the Wara, which is a tribe that Antonio works with in the Shingu in the southeast Amazon. And one thing I want to call people's attention, when you look at the Amazon Conservation Team, when you look at our website, when you look at our annual report, look at the relationship between us and them. Okay? See how this guy's smiling? Okay? It's about relationships. It's not about showing up and, and having the chief put on your organizational t-shirt and taking their picture and flying home to put it on your website. It's about really working in partnership. So that's the approach we try and take. Now, a study by the World Bank a couple of years ago said that 20% uh, of household income in the Amazon comes from the Amazon forest and, and river. Now, remember, as I mentioned earlier, we estimate there's about 30 million people living in the Amazon people of all stripes and colors, literally indigenous peoples, Afro-American peoples. But if you if you did the average across the Amazon, 20% of all household income comes from nature. That could be timber, it could be medicine, that could be fish, 
So this idea that, you know, everybody wants to live in an urban center and, and write the forest off, these people pay a real price when they don't have access to these resources. For example, let me share you with the concept of faunal shadow. And I talk about this in the book. Faunal shadow is a term that biologists came up with to talk about how the impact of big cities are. For the, the biggest city in the Brazilian Amazon is Manaus at the mouth of the Rio Negro, where it empties into the Amazon, uh, over a million people there. And they increasingly have a hard time finding fish because it's overfished. So even if you go some distance upriver and downriver from an house, it's hard to find big fish because it's been overfished. And that is first and foremost to feed the local inhabitants, but even for the tourist trade. People go to the Amazon, they want to eat fish. And these guys are having trouble getting uh, good species because it's been overfished. The other thing is an ethnobotanist I want to point out is that uh, the medicines of the rainforest have barely been tapped. In the past, uh, species like Jaburandi, which is what they used to use to dilate your pupil when you went to the optometrist, Curari, which was the original uh, abdominal muscle relaxant surgery, have been replaced by synthetics. But so what? We need other medicines. With an aging population, we need new anticoagulants to uh, ward off strokes, to treat people who have blood clots. And there's lots of anticoagulants in the Amazon. Vampire bats bite you and you bleed like a stuck pig because they have anticoagulants in their saliva. Okay. The Amazon leech, which is 18 inches long, maybe we're things big in Amazon, yeah, has a unique anticoagulant in its uh, saliva. And when I uh, get in arguments with uh, creationists, I mean, I spent a fair amount of time in Oklahoma, uh, I said, okay, uh, if you think God created everything individually. Uh, why do you think she spent so much time giving every species of leech a different uh, anticoagulant? That, that tends to rock some people back on their heels. Uh, at, at the same time, I want to point out that when the Endangered Species Act was being threatened under Newt Gingrich, evangelicals came to Washington and campaigned for the protection of this because they said, species, God created them, we protect them. So in the environmental field, you need to be ready to partner with all sorts of people, whether they're indigenous shamans, uh, whether they're atheists, or whether they're true believers, um, like some of these evangelical folks. Uh, why not build bridges to different, uh, different uh, segments of the population? We all need clean air. We all need clean water. We all need new medicines. Antonio, you have another question? We have another one yeah. in, um, from a couple of people but just asking about the next season of Plants of the Gods. What can we expect? And, you know, whatever you have to say in response to that, we also have a little video clip as well. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we want to have a major focus on tobacco and on, um, uh, let's see, what did I say? Tobacco and beer, because they're foundational uh, Plants of the Gods. I also am going to leave space open. What I really, really, really want to do is get some of the voices of the shamans shared with some of our listeners. That's been impossible to do during COVID, but now that the world, now that the Amazon is opening up, um, that's a, a, a short-term goal, goal which might only be met in the medium term. I also want to continue to have a very few guests, but very special guests. So I'm going to have Brian Morarescu of the Immortality Key, who talks about the foundations of Western society through a hallucinogenic perspective. Uh, there's a couple of other folks out there I'd like to get. We got incredible response to the Paul Stamets interview. If you haven't listened to that, wow. Uh, I've been following Stamets for decades. And when I sat down with him, I said, my job is to get you to tell stories that you don't tell in, in most interviews about magic mushrooms and its impact on your life and human well-being. So people of that elk, I'd like to get Michael Pollan on the podcast at some point. He's a bit of a moving target. And again, uh, indigenous leaders. I also have reached out to Juliana Furci, the leading mycologist of Chile, who has incredible stories about fungal diversity and its impact on human society and uh, human economies. So she is going to be happening uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Guys, do we want to show the trailer? There we go.
uh, ancient wine is very, very different from the wine we drink today. Um, in fact, uh, a common word used in ancient Greek, the language that was used to draft the Gospels, the language that was used by St. Paul, the greatest missionary Christianity ever knew when he was preaching and converting to the, this, this Hellenic universe around the Mediterranean, writing letters in Greek to Greek speakers. The word they use for wine is pharmakos, right? So the word they use is, is, is drug. So wine was routinely referred to as a drug from like the time of Homer to the fall of the Roman Empire. So over a thousand years go by. And of course, there's a word for wine, oinos, and you see that in the, in the New Testament. But this word uh, pharmakos pops up uh, as, as a ritual formula again and again. And the reason that is, is because wine at the time, and you see this in the ancient literature, uh, is uh, it's it's described as you know, unusually intoxicating, seriously mind-altering, occasionally hallucinogenic, that's true, and potentially lethal, okay? So very, very different wine from the wine of today. Thank you. So I want to sum up by saying how to save the Amazon, since I don't want to be accused of bait and switch. And uh, once again, the, how to save the Amazon is very clear and, and very simple. It's just the implementation that's so difficult. The backbone of Amazonian conservation is protected areas. The good news is you have enormous protected areas in the Amazon. Chiribiquete in Colombia that we've been involved with the expansion of. Um, Tumucamaque in Brazil, right on the Suriname border, are bigger than the country of Belgium. Uh, the challenge is that these big areas were set up because they were so remote and there was no threat, nobody wanted them, uh, that, that which makes them hard to protect and monitor. So as the outside world moves into these really remote areas, these areas are increasingly uh, under threat. We have to focus on the economics of conservation. We have to make sure that local people are benefiting from conservation, that conservation is seen as an economic opportunity, like setting up ecotourism program rather than an economic sacrifice. We have to make sure that people, indigenous peoples, peasant people, other people have title to their lands. If you don't have land title, it makes it hard to hold on to and, and, and decreases your incentive to uh, manage for the long term. Another thing is better understanding of local species. For example, uh, the Amazon Conservation Team Northwest program has pioneered the use of the cacae plant that was first championed by my mentor Schultes and the Colombian botanist Garcia Bariga. This is a plant of the before the AC, the rubber family, which grows well in degraded areas and produces an oil that is so high quality the cosmetic industry is going crazy over. So this is a great way to use these degraded lands, bring back these degraded lands. We need to have much more of a focus on tree agriculture. In other words, agroforestry, not cutting down the rainforest and replacing it with cassava or other crops, but trees which hold the soil in place. And there's many other promising species, promising to us, the indigenous peoples know them and, and rely on them. And we need to listen to them. And then we also need to find ways to improve ecotourism. The Amazon is not set up for mass ecotourism. That's not the way to go. That's not the way to see it. But high end, low impact, that puts money in the pockets of the indigenous peoples and the peasant peoples and not ginormous uh, tourism outfits that are headquartered in Washington or London or Paris. So these things are very straightforward, but uh, they just haven't been given the attention they, they, they merit. There's also novel financial mechanisms like payment for ecosystem services, RED. I deal with these more in the book. I don't want to get into these given the limits uh, on time. We also need more uh, accurate economic analysis where it looks like it's economically uh, viable to set up a dam, whereas every major dam project in the Amazon that I know of silted up before it was supposed to, never returned uh, the money that it was supposed to resulted in displacement of indigenous peoples, Maroons in Suriname, Indians in Brazil. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we pay for this type of stupidity and bad planning. All of us have a stake in the future and production and conservation of the Amazon, whether it's climate change, whether it's new medicines from nature, whether it's our spiritual and ethical well-being, as the shamans say, it's all connected. And when nature is destroyed, it damages us as well. 
So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. If you haven't done so in the chat, please put in where you're dialing in from. And we're open to requests or suggestions for other episodes uh, of Plants of the Gods. Please recommend the podcast to others. Give us a good rating. And let's all move forward uh, for a positive new year and a safe holiday. Uh, unlike the past couple of years, there's a lot of reasons for hope that didn't exist just two or three years ago. So let's not get burned out and disenchanted and disheartened by all the bad things, which are very real and do go on in the world. And let's seize on that hope as reasons for inspiration and for doing the right thing across uh, the world. Because uh, in, in an ethical sense, it benefits everybody. And in a selfish sense, it benefits us as well. So I wish everyone a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, a Happy Kwanzaa. And if I have overlooked any tribal holidays, uh, I'm sure I'll hear from some of my colleagues uh, in the chat afterwards. A special shout out to our Taino colleagues for uh, letting us know that the Tainos do thrive in certain parts of the Caribbean, and we wish them well. And we appreciate us uh, updating us on their progress in terms of cultural preservation. Like I said before, we're all in this together. So thanks to everyone, and we'll hope to see you next time. Good evening.